Okay, welcome back everybody. We'll start with refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange chudam sogi chunam lai janchu bharu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi prola penche sange drupa sho sange chudam sogi chunam la janchu bharu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi Rola penche sange drupa sho sange chudon sogi chunam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi rola penche sange drupa sho letting that motivation connect So we're doing a purification retreat. And so because we're doing a purification retreat, we need to make sure that we are adopting the attitude of purification, um, not adopting an attitude that we are bad and should be punished, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you are not bad and you should not be punished. Karma is not fate. Karma is not destiny. All the disclaimers, okay? So these are things that I think we all know, but it's so important to like not bring our old baggage when we're doing something like confronting our faults. Because remember in Buddhism that all of your faults are dependently arisen, right? Countless causes and conditions came together for you to make the mistakes that you've made in your life. But you made them, and so you're the one that's going to have to cop the result. You want to purify them because you don't want to suffer. You want to purify them so you stop the habit that will lead you to suffer in the future and you don't want to hurt anyone so if you can have this like strong feeling of I don't want to suffer I don't want to hurt anyone and also I want to clear all that fogs my wisdom it's then it's like a happy process you know and I think that if you take it the wrong way it starts to feel like this heavy like self-examination of all the ways that you're terrible and that is not at all the point it should be really liberating to go, oh, that's what I do. Oh, that's what I do. Like self-awareness should be slightly cringy and embarrassing, but mostly just a relief to have found out. If you realize something about yourself, say you realize that you are kind of judgmental and critical, for example, and you were to say to your best friend, do you know, I just realized I'm really judgmental and critical. I'm going to start wor working on it. Do you think they would be surprised? They would be like, yeah, I know. Thank goodness. <sighs> Finally. <laughs> right. So it's also that your stuff isn't as hidden as you think it is. Your mistakes and your bad habits are not so subtle as you think they are. People know how you are and they love you anyway. So you might as well be honest with yourself. I think a lot of what blocks purification is just how painful it is to say, I really do a problematic behavior often, often, most of the day I do problematic behaviors of body, speech, and mind. It's so confronting and then you feel like you need to hide it or defend it or excuse it or prove why you're not bad because of it or build this whole facade on top of it and nobody's fooled. Yeah, nobody's fooled. So you might as well just be real with it. Yeah, and then you can shift it. And everyone in your life will be much relieved, right? And you will be much lighter also, because you won't have that like, what if they find out? They already know. They don't care. <laughs> yeah, even if they don't know the details, even if they don't know the specifics, I think we read each other better than we give uh, credit for. You know, if you were to say to someone secretly, I, I can't get rid of my anger. I think I'm actually a very angry person. And that you say it like a confessional, they'll be like, yeah, I figured. <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> Look at the furrow in your brow. Look at the way you hold your body. Look at the tightness of your speech. Yeah, I'm not surprised. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Um, I use this example a lot, but I think it works well, is to remember how you would be if you found out that you had a skin cancer on your arm. 
and you went to the doctor and you said, what's this weird freckle? And they said, oh, it's skin cancer. Shall we burn it off? You'd be like, oh, yes, burn it off. For goodness sakes, get rid of it. That could kill me. You'd be happy to find the fault and to identify what it was. And you would be happy to have it removed. You wouldn't think, oh, don't take it. That's me. Don't take that skin cancer. It's me. No. Oh, and you wouldn't say, oh, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Let's pretend it's not there. You wouldn't be weird. You'd just say, get it off. For goodness sake, I don't want to die. Right? This is the way we need to approach our faults is as if we'd found a skin cancer and we're so relieved that we found it because now we can get rid of it before it kills us. Do you know what I mean? So the 35 Buddhas is what we're going to look at this session. And the journal exercise that we're going to do this section is going to be related to anger. And when we're doing 35 Buddhas, it's one of these layered practices where maybe the first time you do it, it feels kind of overwhelming. It's a lot of names. It's a lot of colors. It's a lot of movement. Or if you've been doing it for years and years, it can get kind of stale. And it doesn't have to, this practice is incredibly rich. And so in the beginning, what is a good skillful way is to just kind of get used to the words without any pressure. Just get used to the words, no pressure, and start zooming in on just one part and give that your emphasis. So this session, we're gonna give just the first row the most airtime. And we're just gonna kind of get to know them and appreciate the benefits of knowing these beings existed and develop their minds to enlightenment. And by connecting with them, we purify our minds. And then the rest of them, we're just getting to know later. Yeah. And when you're doing the practice of the 35 Buddhas, which is based on the Sutra of the Three Heaps, right from the Buddha, you're adding the physical prostration element, which is not as explicitly listed in the Vajrasattva practice, though, of course, lots of people do prostrations with Vajrasattva as well. 35 Buddhas is one of these like incredibly efficient practices where you're both purifying and accumulating a huge amount of merit. So every time you physically prostrate, you accumulate physical merit, which means that in the future, your body is going to be healthy and strong and capable, and people will find it pleasant to look at, <laughs> you know, not like in a sort of supermodel way, but just like, you know, people will see your face and it will make them happy and relaxed, you know. The way we see when we see each other and people that we love, it doesn't really matter what their face is, but if you love them, they look appealing to you, right? So what we want is the kind of physicality that supports practice, which is not to say that you can't practice if you have a physical disability or if you have physical sort of like non-conforming features for this day and age you know if there's something out of sync or something you've got four noses or something that doesn't mean that you know it's a lost cause it's just kind of acknowledging the fact that certain physical conditions make life a little easier for practice and at, at our stage life is hard enough we would like those physical supports right we'd like to be physically independent and strong and healthy and we'd like to be physically independent, strong and healthy all the way to the end of our life and to have a long, long life. We want that. And so part of the benefit of doing physical prostrations is creating the cause for that now and in the future. Okay, so I'm just going to go through um, a few of those points and see kind of what questions are coming up. So here is the image. I think you guys are used to the image. There's maybe four main versions of this image you'll see. There's images where there's the Buddha in the center and then kind of clusters of the medicine Buddhas or they're all kind of scattered around. In our tradition, we use this image most commonly. It's the easiest to organize your mind, I think, because the colors are in rows. So it's not to say that the other images are wrong. They're not at all wrong. It's just this one is particularly easy to um, visualize and get familiar with. So even the heaviest negative karmas can be purified with 35 Buddhas. Adding physical prostrations adds merit and added physical purification. So it can be even just two palms together. 
two palms together counts as a physical prostration. And we should kind of get in the habit of in our practices and whenever we're in a gompa, whenever we see holy objects, to put our two palms together because that physical prostration is so powerful for purifying negative karma and accumulating merit. So even if you're not doing 35 Buddhas, right? You just walk into a gampa, first thing you do is prostrate. See a holy image, first thing you do is prostrate. It's the underlying psychology of you become receptive to what you respect. If you have a gesture of respect, that reinforces the mentality of respect. So just on a psychological level, that is useful practice. But in terms of a karmic level, all sorts of other things are happening at the same time. So two palms together with those thumbs inside. So if you're gonna do a long prostration and you're not familiar with what long prostrations look like, um, you start at position one is the two, you know, you put your thumbs in, two palms together, start at the heart, then crown between the eyebrows, throat, heart center. Yeah. And then hands down first, not knees. Yeah. Hands down first, then knees, then hands and all the way down, all the way back up and bring your hands back to the start position. So here's what it looks like um, from the side. And then here is what it looks like from the front. <clears throat> so the audio has been muted. So starting there, crown, brow, throat, heart center, and then hands first, then knees, then all the way down, up and over. Crown like that. So the top of the image in the image common to our tradition has Shakyamuni Buddha at the center with a thousand arm Chenrezig at his heart and the seed syllable of thousand arm Chenrezig at his heart. So the founder of the tradition plus the emphasis of great compassion. And then from that, many things emanate. So what we have at the top isn't the 35 Buddhas except for Shakyamuni Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha is the first of the 35 Buddhas. So we have these side characters because we also want to have the cause for a long life, for the purification of form, for general purification of all types, and for support in the bardo. So all of these deities in white are related to purification in a kind of branch way. So Vajrasattva, like we did this morning, Vajrasattva, or excuse me, last night, Vajrasattva is the Buddha of purification, body, speech, and mind, and completely interrupts the um, negative karma's expansion. Kunrig helps us in the intermediate state and also helps us achieve a good next rebirth. Namgyalma helps with long life, so purifies any causes for untimely death. And Virachana, and sometimes this figure is blue and is exhobia. Here we're talking about particularly the purification of the form aggregate. Okay, so then you get your first row, and they're all in the aspect of exhobia, the head of the Vaja family, except for King Lord of the Nagas. And all of these are related to purifying the consciousness aggregate, to purifying anger, and then developing mirror-like wisdom. So we have thoroughly destroying with Vaja Essence, Radiant Jewel, King Lord of the Nagas, Army of Heroes, Delighted Hero, and Jewel Fire. So the first one there, and it's number two because number one is Shakyamuni Buddha, right? So thoroughly destroying with Vaja Essence, Dejin Che Padra, Dorje Nimbo Rabtu Jompela Cha Tse Lo is how you would say it in Tibetan, the Tathagata, thoroughly destroying with Vaja Essence, I prostrate. He's said to purify 10,000 eons of negative karma, and by reciting it, you become enlightened, meaning reciting the name plants the seed for enlightenment on your mental continuum. 
Now, of course, you probably have many seeds for enlightenment on your mental continuum already, but the more the better, the more specific to enlightenment, the better. We want nice, general, good karma, you know, like the karma for resources and the karma for friendship and all that kind of stuff is very important and useful. But what we really want are seeds for enlightenment, which will lead to happiness, to happiness, all the way to complete Buddhahood. So then we have Radiant Jewel. Radiant Jewel purifies 10,000 eons of negative karma as well. For anybody who hears the name of this Buddha, all their wishes succeed. And if a woman hears this name, she will become a wheel-turning king. That's what it says. I don't know. Also hearing this name is the cause to receive long life and help from gods. So again, this is Lama Zopa Rinpoche's commentary, which is based on um, the Nilpa Dhamma, Dhamma Bhadra commentary. So he's relying on good sources. And this is just a good chance to flag something that comes up in a few different su sutras in Buddhism, which is like, may I be reborn always as a man, or may I always take a male form? And then all the women are like, really? Um, you know, and it aggravates us. So context is needed, right? Why does it say that? What is the underlying meaning of that? It's it, back in the day, and of course now as well, it was not as safe to be a woman. What makes it not safe to be a woman? Men, <laughs> right? But so what makes it not safe to be a woman is um, the afflictions of people in male bodies, right? And what it's not saying is that there is any difference between men and women in terms of their mind. Their mental continuums are equal in having innate ignorance, in being clear and knowing, in having Buddha nature. Everybody's consciousness is equal in those things. All of us are equal in our development, our ability to develop into complete enlightenment. What it's saying is that historically, because of the hardships related to a female form, you know, periods and birth and danger and uh, access to education, access to various supports, being theoretically physically weaker, all those things meant life was just a little bit harder for women. So what the prayer is, may I have a conducive rebirth for practice. So it doesn't really mean men at this point. What it means is, may I have all the condu conducive circumstances for my practice to go smoothly. Yeah. So you don't need to think I want to be reborn as a man. And I don't myself. Um, you know, I think that it's nowadays you're socialized as a woman to have loving kindness, compassion, strength, competency, independence. So it's kind of the best of both worlds if you're born in a country that is working on it, right? Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. Also, if you like being in a male form, be in a male form, keep being in a male form all the way to enlightenment. It's just kind of acknowledging that the way men are socialized, it's not as okay to develop compassion and kindness in a really obvious, visceral, acting out way. Like there's a lot of um, toughen up, you know, kind of be a man, like be hard. And that makes it hard for guys. And maybe it would be nice to have a break and be socialized female and have the kind of supports that women have when they grow up. Pros and cons to both rebirths is the point, right? Pros and cons to both rebirths. So when we're looking at these things, we want to use the critical eye of who was the audience? What was the time? Who was the audience? What was the time? And also remember that the Buddha in his time treated men and women with great respect and equality and always said that the continuums of both were equal. Do you want to unpack that at all? Or are you happy to move on? It's something that comes up, so it needs to be flagged. But um, uh, if you're having qualms, please do bring them up. Is it making sense? It's about a conducive rebirth? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so King Lord of the Nagas is the one that's got slightly different hand gesture and has a white head. And King Lord of the Nagas purifies a thousand eons of negative karma, as well as purifying harm from Nagas. So because this Buddha liberated so many Nagas from suffering, benefiting and healing them, they are indebted to him. So if you recite the name of King Lord of the Nagas, any sicknesses caused by Nagas will be cured. 
so nagas are you know it, it's tricky because it's not our worldview that we grew up with but sometimes they're said to look a little bit like uh, dragons but like the dragons that are snake-like um sometimes they are snake just snakes um sometimes they're more like mermaids <laughs> right and most people don't have the karma to see them so people don't have the karma to see them and yet they are all over the place particularly around water and so if you do rude things around water, like if you go to the bathroom in a pond, or if you dump garbage, or if you like spit into the water, you know, with a, like an obvious disrespectful attitude, and it lands on one of these beings, it said some of them are a little vindictive and might cause you illness. <laughs> okay, so sometimes weird stuff happens after we've been swimming in a lake, right? Like you come back with a random rash or something and, or you come back and you feel kind of weird and woozy. Sometimes that's naga harm. Sometimes it can be fairly serious. And um, the proviso is, of course, use your common sense, go to the doctor, get a cream, do all the practical things from a worldly perspective while also holding the possibility that some of the harm might have come from beings you can't see. And so the lesson here is, if the harm has already happened, prayers to King Lord of the Nagas can be very useful. And just generally in our daily life, we want to be extra respectful of the environment. We want to just because it's good and interdependence and, you know, climate awareness, of course, but also because there's a lot of beings in the environment that we can't see and those are their homes and just as an act of compassion. So King Lord of the Nagas helps with that. Um, it's said that Naga harm can kind of take the form of um, skin diseases, rashes, uh, aches and pains, and kind of general malaise and fatigue that doesn't seem to have other reasons. So if there's not an obvious kind of medical reason for your malaise and a not an obvious psychological reason, it might be some sort of Naga issue. So anyway, just interesting to sit with, take it or leave it. Um, and then we have Army of Heroes. So army of heroes purifies the negative karma of gossiping. Nocho Dhamma Bhadra says that it purifies all the negative karmas of speech. So that senseless speech karma, you know, in the 10 non-virtues, when we're talking about the non-virtues of speech, senseless speech, meaningless speech, idle gossip, that is one of the ones that is theoretically one of the lightest negative karmas. But because we do it so often, it becomes heavy. And when we do a lot of senseless speech, just like, you know, gossiping about whatever politics, whatever, like without purpose, what it does is it kind of ruins the power of your speech. So your words have less impact. They're not taken as seriously. People don't listen to you or believe you as much. And you want your words to have weight when you have something important to say, right? So purifying gossip karma is like an incredible gift of this Buddha. It's such a useful tool because probably for us nice people, idle speech is one of our most common non-virtues. Yeah, it's not mean, it's not meant to harm, it's not anything in particular, but it's not really having a point. <laughs> yeah. And um, remember that idle speech doesn't really mean the content, it's the intention. So you could talk about football, but do it from a place of, I want to connect with others, I want to share and bond and create community support, then it's not senseless speech. You could talk about football because you want to fill in the space, because you don't like silence, because you're feeling awkward and neurotic, non-virtue, right? So it's not the content, it's the intention. But nevertheless, we do <laughs> idle speech quite often. And then Delighted Hero purifies 2,000 eons of negative karma. And Jewel Fire, the last one, purifies the negative karma of mind that has been stained by the pollution of the Sangha. So when people make offerings to the Sangha, because they have many delusions, the offerings are polluted, which can affect any Sangha member who is not yet an Arya being. So reciting this name protects against that. According to Dhammabhadra, reciting the name once purifies a hundred thousand eons of causing disunity within the Sangha or criticizing the Arya Sangha. 
The preliminary practice of prostrations also says that this name purifies the five immediate negativities, especially that of causing disunity among the Sangha. So this concept of pollution is kind of an interesting one. It's, it's basically an acknowledgement of human nature. Okay, so if you live at a Dharma center, um, whether you're an ordained Sangha member or you're someone who is making use of communal Dharma things, the people who make those offerings make offerings from a really beautiful, generous, pure heart of altruism and generosity, and also some attachment expectation, wanting to be seen in a certain light, wanting a certain amount of attention, having entitlement, you know, it's mixed. So some people offer offerings with a really pure heart. Some people offer offerings with a mixed motivation that goes all amongst any number of things. And all of that, nevertheless, is towards an incredibly powerful thing. So the Sangha as an entity, which is like four or more ordained people, um, or one Arya Bodhisattva who is um, not necessarily ordained, it's a powerful entity to give an offering to. And so it's, um, it's something that we want to be really intentional about and make sure our motivation is really clear with. But if we're at Dharma centers, um, we might be, you know, using water, eating food, you know, using uh, resources, using the library, and all of these objects that have been offered to the Sangha or to the Dharma Center are more karmically loaded than those same objects in like a family home. Because the reasons they wound up there are deeper, bigger reasons, and the objects they were offered towards are more powerful. Does that kind of make sense? So the mixed motivation can bring a lot of just kind of complications and we wanna just kind of clear that. Um, this Buddha is helpful also just from the fact of who knows how many times in the past we've caused disunity in the spiritual community by being divisive, by being gossipy, by being critical, by being judgmental. Um, not giving people a break, not giving people the benefit of the doubt, holding grudges, you know, all the things that we do in life, in work, in social situations, we probably did in a spiritual center as well, and might even be doing now, right? And so we really want to be aware of that, purify that, stop doing that. And so thank goodness this particular Buddha um, emphasizes that in his purification. As a um bookstore keeper at a center mm. and also uh, recently I took on the job of organizing our library mm. I really 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 appreciate that last comment because I know that I have gotten frustrated with people for leaving things yeah and so um, thankfully now I'll have a different attitude <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's tricky when you help at Dharma centers and to make sure that the finances are all managed really, really ethically, really, really transparently. And that if people make offerings for, say, Dharma books at a library, that that's where the money goes towards. If you have a power bill that needs to be paid, too bad. That's not what that money is for. The money was intended for this purpose. You have to give it to that purpose. It's so heavy karma to misuse offerings directed to the Sangha or directed to a Dharma center. It's like really heavy. So always use the money for the reason it was offered for. Um, incredibly important. And of course, if you haven't, make sure you purify right away and then change. Um, you know, it's a little bit like if you just worked at a secular nonprofit. Right. If you worked at a secular nonprofit and people gave a lot of money for a fundraising drive for a particular, I don't know, getting a particular person out of prison and all of this money and energy was going towards that. But the nonprofit said, oh, but we have to pay the staff and it's sort of related and mm, and they make all sorts of kind of like tangled, twisted sort of justifications and kind of siphon the money to where they really want it to go because this one thing got more energy than they expected and they have need over here, it's not cool. So what do you do, right? Practically speaking, if you have money that's been offered for one thing, but you need more money for this other thing, you tell people that, <laughs> right? You don't overthink it, don't be sneaky, be very transparent and say, 
We've got a lot of offerings for this one wonderful project and it's under control. And we actually have a little surplus. You benefactors, would it be okay if we use some of that money for this? And you're just really explicit, really transparent, and you always ask and really honor whatever they say. So whether you're talking Dharma centers, Sangha, secular, whatever, just really using things for what they were intended for is a kind of healthy way of navigating objects that come into your life, particularly holy objects. Yeah, Karen, go ahead. So if the general understanding of the proceeds from the bookstore are to benefit the center in any way that the center needs, then is that um, a proper use of the money? Dharma books is very delicate. Um, I would read the FPMT website on that because usually money for Dharma books should go back to buying more Dharma books. <laughs> and it's kind of a closed circle. Yeah, so that money goes to more of the same. <clears throat> and you really don't want to be making um, a profit off of Dharma things. You could make a profit off of a, a Tibetan scarf that has no holy objects on it. That's just Tibetan handicraft and it helps the Tibetan person and it helps the center. And that's a lot easier because it's not a holy object. But holy objects shouldn't really be ever used for profit ever. And they are constantly. They are in India. They are in Singapore. They are here in the West. Like people sell holy objects like they're commodities, but that is really, really heavy. Um, so if you're selling statues in the Dharma shop, pretty much that money should go back to more statues. If you're selling books in the Dharma shop, that should go towards buying more books, right? It should be a closed loop. Um, unless there is a giant sign that says, please, um, this percentage is just a, a recommended donation to the center or something, but that gets a little complicated. Yeah, it gets a little complicated. So really do read that that in that FPMT policy because a lot of centers have kind of thought, well, it's all to the cause. It's all for the cause, but also be careful. It's it's a loaded karma. Yeah. So this has really just come up because yeah. of the liberation blankets. Yeah. And um, my original thought was that um, they would be free for anyone to take um, with a suggested, but not a, not certainly not a for sure donation. Um, but now I'm thinking that that is even too much to ask. It's more like, please support the center. Here are free Dharma blankets, like separate things. Support the center, here's a bowl. The center needs support. We have to pay the bills. Here's what we need. You know, have it really clear. Here's our power bill. Here's our rent. Here's our staff costs. We need help. Here's a bowl. Here are some free things. It is unrelated. Yeah. So, like, yeah. So half of the cost of the blankets were was donated, mm. and half wasn't. So we need to come up with half of the cost. Yeah. So, but what I'm hearing you say is that. We just need to separate that out. And you could say, you know, we, we need to fundraise for whatever the shipping or the added cost of these blankets and just have that really explicitly said. It's, it's really like, be more specific, be more explicit than you feel is necessary when it's related to Dharma things. Yeah. And really, you know, here is what we need the money for. Here is where the money's going to. The Dharma is always free because the Dharma is so priceless, you could never put a price tag on it. So like when you pay for a course, you're not paying for a course, you're paying a facility fee for the rent. And that should be quite explicit in all of the advertising that you're not paying for a course. The course is free because it's priceless, but the buildings need upkeep. We need you know a facility fee if you're gonna come and use them. You know, that's how Dharma centers should operate is that courses are always free. The facilities, however, are not because here is capitalism, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, some centers have done really creative things like really small memberships for all of their members and, and saying um, you have infinite use of the facilities if you give $5 a month. And then people feel like, oh, $5 a month, that's no problem at all. I'll set up a, de a direct deposit. But you know, you got 200 people doing $500, you know, $5 a month, it really helps. Yeah. 
so the, so there's ways of being creative and transparent um so it's like whatever nonprofit transparency then you have to elevate it for dharma reasons um money that that is like profit money that's kind of okay to use for anything in a dharma center really has to be a non-dharma object like a handicraft yeah journals notebooks shawls i mean cushions are not holy objects per se right mats are not holy objects per se it's just something to put your bum on right so that kind of stuff is less loaded than like a book or a statue So anyway, just good to know, just good to know. And um, also good to know you can purify it. And, you know, you, you find out when you find out and you purify as best you can. And goodwill goes a long way, but it's not enough to just say I had a good reason because the holy objects are particularly loaded. Yeah. So when we're looking at the 35 Buddhas and this first row, you can be thinking about what each one purifies or not right? You can, they have power, the names themselves, because of the beings who created them. But if you want to organize your mind in a kind of general way, rather than Buddha by Buddha, you can think blue purifies anger. Blue purifies anger. So before you kind of get into the practice, you want to be thinking physically, verbally, mentally, what has my anger looked like recently? You know, physically, when I'm angry, what happens? You know, am I more likely to be careless with life? Am I more likely to take the objects of others or to take them for granted? You know, because there's stealing and that's obvious, but there's also like not returning what you borrowed. <laughs> that's stealing too, the second you think it is mine. So you could have borrowed something for 20 years and it not be stealing, but it becomes stealing the moment you think, well, now it's mine. Yeah. Um, even just sort of taking for granted the objects of others, like if you're staying at someone's house, like uh, kind of thinking, I'm going to have a really long shower or I'm going to, you know, eat all the foods, you know, somehow taking for granted. Yeah. All the things in that genre, you know, what do they look like? in that stealing genre and particularly right today in this session looking at anger does anger feel like it feeds a sense of entitlement which makes you more likely to disregard life or disregard the possessions of others you know like sometimes when you're angry your pride jumps in to help <laughs> and it's like since I'm so upset I'm gonna feel like I deserve this and I deserve that and screw you all and oh, like that some people's anger looks like that yeah. And then, you know, physically also like sexual misconduct. We know that sexual misconduct is usually about attachment, but it can also be about anger and power and all that kind of creepy stuff too. So again, like you have to know a fault to be a fault and to regret it for it to be able to be purified. If it's just hanging out in the background of, I don't want to look at that, it's growing in strength and the suffering you're going to experience is going to be more and more until you own it and purify it. Um, so then verbally, you know, what does anger look like? Verbally, what does anger look like? For some people, it is absolute silence, <laughs> but a grumpy face, right? For some people, it's just very obvious, harsh speech, divisive speech, very obvious. Some people lie more when they're angry, but probably more likely they're divisive. Some people are more senseless speech, just kind of ranting and venting but it's probably going into harshness or divisiveness. So it's just about self-knowledge, right? And then when you're angry, obviously ill will is its best friend. So um, so that'll be the little journal exercise that we'll do in a minute. Um, are, are there questions so far about just the general premise of the 35 Buddhas or anything that we've talked about so far? Or worries or ideas? Yeah, Eleanor, please. I was just wondering about um, when you speak about the 1000 eons of, you know, I don't really get that, you know, or 10,000 or the, you know, when we talk about merit. So I wonder, could you comment on that, please? Like how long is an eon? Yeah. 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 But where did those numbers come? How do those yeah. numbers come into existence? I mean, yeah. yeah. 
that is in a I just read the commentary and tell you what they say yeah. I have no idea right but um an eon is a huge length of time right the analogy yeah. I give is like if there was a giant granite mountain and you wiped it with a silk cloth once every thousand years by the time it had been rubbed away it would be an eon or you know like these crazy analogies or you have like a giant pit and once a hundred years you put a mustard seed in it by the time it's filled up an eon would have gone by it's a crazy length of time so we're we're talking about beginningless time we've mm -hmm. existed from beginningless time and it's weird because we say from right from beginningless time time is beginningless our consciousnesses are also beginningless so when we talk about doing a big wipe of a huge amount of negative karma related to a specific deity what it means is that that deity's intention went in this certain area in a concentrated way again and again and again. So by connecting with them, we're able to use them as a powerful condition to purify. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good kind of way to frame it. You know, maybe it's a little bit like just that simple thing of if someone has integrated a simple concept, they can say that simple concept in such a way that it has a profound effect on people, but someone else can say the same thing and have never thought about it. And it just kind of bounces off and nobody really registers. You know, for example, a lot of the things that Thich Nhat Hanh says are very simple, powerful, profound truths. And when he says them, everyone's like, wow, that was really Ooh. powerful. Like talking about the Heart Sutra, you know, think of form is empty, emptiness is form, is like the wave is water and the water is the wave. And you go, wow, yeah, that really frames it. I, wow, yeah. But someone else could say the same thing coming from no depth and it sound really trite, you know, really cliche and not have any resonance. So because of the power mm. of him having practiced so well, he can say a simple thing and you connect with it and it goes straight in. So it's maybe a little bit like that with these Buddhas where they've put so much time, energy, practice, strength into a certain way of purifying, like the relationship with Nagas or the relationship with disunity in the Sangha, so much time and energy that when we link up with that, we're able to kind of ride their coattails. It's mm. the coming together of those two things mind meeting a mind yeah mm. you know so we're all i mean at our level now we're conditions for each other right now we're just ordinary people we are conditions for happiness conditions for suffering conditions for purification conditions for rejoicing conditions for negativity we're conditions for each other all the time the more we practice the more powerful a condition we become you know, and the stronger our karmic connections with each other are, the more dynamic that whole thing becomes as well. It doesn't make a kind of sense. I mean, karma is, is the hardest thing because it's extremely hidden phenomena. You know, intellectually, you can get your head around it easier than emptiness, maybe. But emptiness is actually not as subtle as the spectrum of causation. And so we have to keep remembering that with karma. There's manifest phenomena, there's hidden phenomena, there's extremely hidden phenomena. Extremely hidden phenomena is karma. And really the whole gambit of karma is only seen by an enlightened mind. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like you have to take these things on face value or have to take them blindly. I think find a way that it feels logical or f even feel like this is a nice formula that organizes my mind to change the things I already want to change anyway. Whether I was Buddhist or not, I would want to work on my anger. Yeah, whether I was Buddhist or not, whether I believe that there are beings who are enlightened or not, I would want to connect with a process that seems to facilitate habit changes. So there's also just that surface worldly level of these systems help you develop concentration, focus and intention immediately right off the bat you know right away you start having a more focused mind you're visualizing these 35 buddhas you're thinking about purifying anger and then you're moving with your body a lot is happening in your system right away and then all these other layers hopefully are the case as well all the things the commentaries say hopefully are the case as well but even if they're not it's still a worthwhile practice so that can kind of help you be motivated too it helps me be motivated to think like my own teacher who is 80 
three does something like 300 prostrations every single morning still <laughs> still every single morning and he has one of the most clear most steady minds of anyone i know and of course there are many beings like this but you know i happen to know him and have traveled with him and you know here at three o'clock in the morning in the room next to me him clunk down on the floor doing his prostrations hear him saying the names of the 35 buddhas in tibetan you know and i like wake up at three in the morning hearing him go clunk in the room next door and go wow i should do that i'm going back to bed <laughs> you know i'm gonna wait a few hours and then do the same probably half as much and I should be doing twice as much because I'm so much younger and more healthy or whatever. But, you know, he can do it because of his joyous efforts and because of the patterns he's created over a lifetime. And so I try and compare myself to him while at the same time knowing I can't live up to his standard yet. But I will, you know, I'm working on it. It's building up. So he, treating it as an inspiration. Someone I look up to does this and it seems to work out well for him. Yeah, I'll have it go. You know, or you watch someone like Lama Zopa Rinpoche prostrate and his body, you know, hurts so much, obviously, on a worldly sense, you know, he shows the aspect of, you know, and he showed the aspect of having a stroke and he's got diabetes and all these things and he'll just keep prostrating in a slow motion, decisive, intentional, beautiful way again and again, it's so beautiful. So it's not like it has to be this like robust athletic process, it can be very slow if your body is not cooperating and still have incredible power, maybe even more power. So just really gently, really slowly. It's not a race, it's not an athletic process, but it's a good way to reinforce what you already believe is important. Like, I don't wanna be so angry, et cetera. Yeah. In, yeah, any follow-up or add-ons? Thank you. This is exciting to talk about purification. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to, I've been kind of rustling around with this for a while. Um, if you're in a group and there's, I sense that there's a person who's kind of got this toxic energy mm -hmm. and I don't want to be criticizing, but I also want to have a healthy boundary. Um, and maybe also let other people know like, Hey, I think we should be a little careful here. Hmm. Um, what would you say about that? Like, is it, when is it divisive speech and when is it skillful speech? Kind yes. Of that. Yeah. I think that, I think that part of us knows the difference between divisiveness and skillfulness once we get on a roll, like your initial thing of here's what I've seen. Here's what it makes me worry about. Here's what we should do to protect them and us and you've like made the case, then that is good. And then what happens is that your um, attachment or your anger or some other affliction likes sort of getting attention for having kind of a dramatic conversation and it'll co-opt it. And then you'll repeat yourself. So it's, it's often when you start repeating the story that the affliction has co-opted it. So it started as skillful speech and then it got divisive because you got on a roll or you started to vent or started to like bring in other information that's unrelated to this particular issue and like reinforce and, you know, but the case had already been made. So I think it's just kind of knowing like, when has agitation bubbled up? When have you started to maybe enjoy the attention or feel kind of, I don't know, delighted in the drama or, you know, kind of like insidious, small, little afflictions start to creep into what started out as a really important conversation, just a hard one. Yeah. So I think if you sit with your memory, if we all sit with our memory of when we've had hard conversations about other people's faults, when was it criticism and divisiveness? When was it just, we need to call out negative behavior because it harms them, it harms us, it's dangerous. Um, and we need to protect everybody involved, especially if this is an ongoing habit of harmfulness. Because, you know, boundaries are incredibly important. It's just not making them barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, the intention. When in doubt, check the intention. Yeah. 
<clears throat> divisive speech has to intend to separate two people from another or two groups from another. I'm telling you this information because I want you to turn against them and to shun them. That's divisive speech. I feel like I'm telling you this because I want us to work together to find a solution or to take care of them and us, et cetera, then it's not. Easy to fool ourselves, of course, <laughs> but you know, the general premise from the outside anyway. Okay, for 15, 20 minutes, let's do a little journal exercise related to purifying anger and write a bit about how physically, verbally, and mentally your own personal expression and habit of anger manifests, okay? So we're just looking at this first row and, you know, they're all very different uh, variations of purification, but if we're just kind of making it simple and thinking blue, purifying anger, purifying the consciousness aggregate, if we want to be thinking about the five wisdoms, it also helps us develop mirror-like wisdom. If we know about the five Buddha families, it's interesting to remember these extra things, but that is not so important right now. Right now, just take a minute and do some journaling. So that's what we'll do now. And we'll go for 20 minutes <clears throat> and I'll give you a little bell one minute before we finish. <clears throat> so you can have your um, cameras on if you like the group connection thing, or if you'd rather have them off, that's okay too. And if you don't want to write, you can of course pull up a word document or something. Okay. Everybody back. Now it can be a bit um, cringy or confronting, and um, but if you want to share, that would be lovely. And of course, if you want me to snip out any things that you share in the group, you can just send me a message in the chat and I'll make sure to do that. But when you were thinking about anger physically, were there any expected or unexpected things that came up, just starting with the body? Anything you noticed about yourself? you get tight or maybe you get loose <laughs> maybe you get a tension headache or maybe you get kind of energized or what happens physically when you're angry and i think that that is I mean, that's it's horrible and it's horrible when you have you know kind of things like this happening in the family where you're just incredibly confronted and outraged and I think it's it's so important to realize that with anger so often is also a correct observation, just the wrong conclusion. And we sometimes think we have to get rid of the correct observation that's being made during that time because we know anger is negative. So it might be that, you know, your wisdom is saying <clears throat> this, this, and this behaviors uh, should never happen are unacceptable. Um, we have to protect whatever sort of thoughts coming up, but then the mind gets agitated and it takes it and co-ops that analytical ability and it's off to the races. And it sometimes, I don't know if this happens to you guys, but like a bad thing can happen in your personal life. And then it reminds you of all the other bad things that have ever happened in the world of a related type. And it gives you more reasons why you have apathy and despair, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like rather than, wow, this happens all over the world, this, you know, whatever this issue is, it, it's a universal human experience. I am infinitely connected to all sentient beings. We're all in it together. Let the compassion expand outward and really kind of breathe into the interconnectedness of things that's the ideal. But what usually winds up happening is you just get more fuel for despair or rage. And so it's, it's being able to untangle the agitation in the body and the agitation in the mind from the grains of truth that are also there. Because you don't have to snuff out the, I see something is wrong. I must address wrongs. That must be kept. But when people do the wrong thing, when they hurt us, when they hurt people we love, when they hurt vulnerable people, whatever is happening that is harmful, you know, our first reaction is what is wrong with you, not what happened to you. And our first response should be what happened to you, that you would do such a thing, because no one does horrible things out of nowhere. You know, the first, so if we can gently start to train ourselves, oh, what happened to you, that you would do such a thing. Then the first response is compassion and stability and steadiness, not at all complacency, 
not at all saying what they did was okay, but you're like in that clear positioning where then you can figure out strategically what you, can you do to mitigate the harm. So I guess never talk over the top of your own wisdom just because you know that anger is negative. And I don't think you would, but you know, just holding that there's a wisdom there. And then when you have that nausea and that tightness and that, like, you know, you're get overheated or you go to ice, you know, sometimes we have fire anger. Sometimes we have ice anger and holding on to it and nourishing it is why there are the hot hells and the cold hells. They're not somewhere that anyone sends us. They are creations of our own mind. We go paralyzed and frozen and cold, or we get boiling full of rage and fire. And then we reflect that in our environments and it can happen even just within our human experience. Suddenly everything feels boiling and agitated or everything feels paralyzed and frozen. And so when you know that experience, then you use it as information. You go, oh, I have anger. Okay, that's information. I know that anger is not justified. I don't, I know that I don't want it, but here it is. That's what I'm working with. That's the practice today you know, okay, here we are. And, and ask yourself those questions about how can I go back a few stages of what was my expectation? And that is so confronting when it's been a big harm, because you think my expectation, what my expectation was that people would be relatively nice to each other. That's not a crazy expectation or that people would be civilized or that people would be consistent or that, you know, you have some sort of like annoyance that you would even have to check in on your own expectations. But expectations, you know, and attachment, they go hand in hand, don't they? And just because it's reasonable doesn't mean it's not still got an attached flavor. Remember, attachment exaggerates. So you might have an expectation that person A would not harm vulnerable person B. And that is a reasonable and valid hope for humanity but to expect human beings to not act out of afflictions is exaggerated. It's so hard, right? Because it's like, you're not, you're not wanting to let go of your um, integrity or let go of your sense of what is right and wrong or what's important, but that doesn't have to be all tied up with your expectations of how people should behave. What you want is here's how people could behave. Here's how I hope people will behave, but I will expect them to behave out of afflictions. Because that is how they usually, that would be not exaggerated. I will expect them to behave out of afflictions. That's right on the money. That's pretty much most of the time. So it's, it's the most confronting thing on earth to realize that when you have anger, it's usually because your attachment didn't get what it wanted. If you didn't have that attachment, you wouldn't have the rage at it being thwarted. So you go back to the attachment and you check and you're like, where was my exaggeration? My exaggeration was some sort of Pollyanna thinking that people are better than they are. They have Buddha nature, they're not a lost cause, but we are tangled and messy and do horrible things. And it's bloody poignant, you know? So then you soothe and settle the attachment into reasonableness, and then there's nothing to be thwarted that becomes fuel for anger. Yeah. So when you're doing purification, it's delicate because the, you know, the teachings on purification are recognize a fault to be a fault. Anger is wrong. It must be purified. Anger is the wish to harm. The wish to harm is never justified. Stop it, purify it, done and dusted. But that's not like the whole story. We also want to look at, well, why was there anger? What was the grains of truth? What was the exaggerated assumptions? What have been the patterns of my life? And use it as an invitation to like open up this whole, you know, eons long story of how we get angry. You know, not just say, oh, don't be angry, bad slap. That's not useful. You know, it's just going to be suppression. And we all know how suppression doesn't work out well. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, purify it. Absolutely. Recognize it. Absolutely. But also just like do the deep dive in what gets my anger going, you know? So, and what does it feel like? So knowing what it feels like in the body or what it manifests like in the body is super useful because sometimes body awareness comes before mental awareness. 
you don't even realize that you're angry mentally, but you know your body is doing something. It's getting shaking, it's getting agitated, something's happening. So you go, okay, anger is happening. What's up? So then verbally, you know, you might say divisive things, you might say harsh things, but also it's also good to use sort of look at anger in terms of what is the pattern of speech that happens when I'm angry? Like, do I get more blunt and brusque? Or do I get more verbal and I kind of info dump and, you know, say tons and tons and tons of words in a kind of domineering way to kind of suffocate the people I'm mad at with all of my reasoning and logic, right? Because some people are angry and they just so many words. And some people, when they're angry, curt little spikes. So knowing how yours looks, that's the important thing. And it might change, right? But that, that's a helpful way of also catching when anger is arising. You're like, oh, my voice gets a bit high or it gets a bit low when I'm angry. Or it gets a bit fast or a bit slow when I'm angry. Just checking, like, what is it like for me? How will I catch it? Did you have thoughts about the, the verbal side of, of anger? What, is, what are your words like when you're angry? habits, affect, et cetera, what happens to your words? I notice that, so first I get really tight and then I kind of spit little venomous short things out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Little like zingers. Yep. Yep. That's a common one. <laughs> when you're trying to get through to someone, and they're not ha letting you get through to them, it's not going to work to just keep forcing it. If you said it perfectly, with no anger, with the best articulation, with the best diction, with the best humor, with the best analogies, if you said it all perfectly, if they're not listening, it doesn't matter. And I think sometimes this is what we do is we keep trying to say the thing again and again in the perfect way, thinking that that's why they didn't understand. I must not have said it right. That's why they don't understand. No, they weren't listening. That's why they didn't understand. They don't want to. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, don't punch your way in. Just try and um, soothe the atmosphere and then try again. But I think that sometimes we have to cut our losses too. Cut our losses, pick our battles. It's all cliche, but gosh, it's true. And I don't know how many of you have had this hard, hard, hard one lesson of sometimes people will never understand. And there's a couple points where you're not going to see eye to eye. And that doesn't mean you don't love them and they don't love you. And that doesn't mean that there's no way forward. And it doesn't mean it's a deal breaker, but sometimes they're just not going to get you. And oh, well, and it's heartbreaking, but um rather than trying to say it just the right way, thinking deeply about why wasn't it heard at all. I just found myself um, pretty pretty aware of the verbal part of this, but mm. far less with the physical and mental, and I'm not sure that I really understand the difference between those two because the, the, the feeling that came up for both of them is just, I'll notice my body and I'll, I'll notice my mind becoming agitated. It's yeah. very distinct, very clear, but I don't know that I can really separate the two. Could you speak to that? Well, I mean, they're fundamentally not that separated. They're all interconnected and they feed off of each other. Body, speech, mind pinging around, you know, starts with mind, then has a body affect and a verbal affect. But sometimes we don't notice the, the mind affect until we feel our body or see our speech. You know, it starts in the mind, but we don't often catch it in the mind. We catch it when it mm -hmm. kind of starts coming out. So it's it's one of these things where it doesn't really matter what your gateway is into catching it. Just try and catch it so it doesn't get ahead of steam. Mm -hmm. um, but it's good to know, you know, kind of like in the mind, is it just kind of a generalized agitation, spinning, you know, can't really settle, lots and lots of content, lots of justifications and reinforcements and you know grumbling in words or is it just kind of like dark thunder clouds of rage <laughs> you know? 
And like, you know, is the body like shaking? Like sometimes we get shaky when we're angry or does it get tight and it's immovable? You know, just sort of knowing those things is, is useful. So it sounds like you get the, like the thread with all three body, speech and mind is that there's agitation agitation is the key word for you and that is a key word for most of us i think with anger is that it's shaking mm -hmm. yeah for some people it's frozen but for a lot of us it's shaking this is awesome thank you so much for this teaching but um i years ago i got really angry with the police officer you know there was a they were going to close the road they told us they're going to close the road but then they closed the road two hours early and i got stuck and I went up and found the guy who was responsible. He's a poor guy standing there with a sign, right? And I ripped him a new one. And um, the reason I'm bringing that up is I walked away from that and I felt really good. It's like, oh, that felt so good to just let it go. And sometimes in my mind, I think about anger. Not always. I have many, many. One of the, This is a great journal exercise because I have many kinds of being angry. But um, one of them, I think it's like, it just feels good to be a two-year-old again and you know, <laughs> to not have the, the controls and things. I'd love you to comment on that. Yeah, there, there's certainly that'll happen when you feel satisfied with your expression of anger and that showed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> unfortunate, but very common. Yeah. Um, a part of it is that we know we need to be more assertive and we're used to getting our anger to help us be assertive, but really we just need to be assertive. We need to say the truth of things. We need to say them clearly and boldly and directly. We need to just say the truth more often rather than bite our tongue and feel like, oh, I hope they get it. Oh, I hope they alter their behavior. I hope they notice that they're bothering people. Oh, I hope, you know, with our sort of like, I don't know, Northern European sort of socialization of women, you know, that form or like everyone has, every culture has their form of, oh, I don't want to say anything, but what they're doing is really obnoxious, but I don't want to say anything, right? So when you finally say the thing, it's so cathartic. You feel good. You finally said the truth of the thing. The problem is, is that you needed your anger to get you there. What we need to practice is just saying the thing without needing the anger to get us off the seat. So feel the satisfaction of how nice it is to speak the truth and to speak the truth to power, to speak the truth to people who are misbehaving, to not bite your tongue and suffocate and suppress and, you know, kind of feel like a good Dharma student just lets people get away with murder. That is not a good Dharma student. Um, you know, a good Dharma student is bold enough and brave enough to say uncomfortable things, you know. Um, so that's one piece is just the good piece <laughs> in your so story was you told them how they had done the wrong thing that needed to happen. What wasn't good is that you did it with anger. And so it probably landed in a way that wounded them and in no way corrected their behavior. They would have just kind of gotten aggravated and thought, ah, that annoying woman, you know, or whatever. And maybe they adjusted and maybe they didn't, but they probably didn't have a great learning from that. Occasionally people do, but you know, when, um, I don't know. Have you ever been with a whole bunch of little kids like you're like babysitting or something and they're all being chaotic and you think, oh, I'll just be like the sweet caregiver and just let them play. I'm not going to be oppressive like my oppressive childhood. Let them play, let them play. And then they get more and more chaotic and you get fed up and you think, actually, they need a structured activity. OK, kids, we're going to paint. They actually kind of relax after the initial resistance. Right. Like initially they're like, don't tell me what to do. But after that, they're kind of like, oh, good. Someone told us, you know, and I think that so much of life is like that, where generally speaking, we love our chaos and we don't want to be told what to do. But actually, in a lot of settings, someone being in a leadership role, even if they're the leader's servant, setting the tone helps the group be happier. Just say the truth of things. This shouldn't happen. This should happen. It's open for discussion, but here's how I see it. And if you're doing it without anger, then it's um, flexible to play with and it's not setting up for a conflict. If you do it from anger, then if someone contradicts you, then it's a fight, you know, or a humiliation or whatever. 
So divorced from anger, just having strength, maybe even wrath occasionally, but divorced from the wish to harm is a tool that we need as Dharma practitioners. It just is so delicate to use because we're not used to having power without anger, but they can be separated. But yes, we don't want to delight in um, getting a zinger in, although it's very human. It's very human. Zinger delights. Yes. Yeah. Other other speech ones or or mind ones. Yeah. What you notice happens in your mind if you get um, busier in the mind or if you get paralyzed in the mind when there's a lot of anger. With with all of these things, I think it can help all of our relationships if we develop deeper and deeper self-awareness. And it doesn't seem like self-awareness and better relationships go together or self-awareness and more compassion for others go together. But I think the more deeply you know yourself and forgive yourself, the more you see how everyone is a version of what you do. It looks a little different. There's some different details. There's just there's different ways we got brought up, but we're just versions of the same thing. And so then when people are badly behaved, you're like, oh yeah, I know that place. Yep, I know that place. I don't know if I can help you out of it, but I'm not going to blame you for it. I know that place. Yeah, and having some kind of empathy and affinity comes from self awareness, and with enough empathy and affinity, compassion is really easy because there's a relation. Yeah. So purifying anger, um, I thought we would experiment with just doing the short version of the 35 Buddhist practice where we say the names just one time. So you won't be able to get in one prostration, one full length prostration per Buddha, just do at a nice pace, whatever feels nice, while trying to say the names as best you can but really focusing on that first row, particularly the blue row. So we'll do a round of uh, 35 Buddhas and then we'll stop for a lunch break. And after lunch, we'll do more um, Bajasattva practice and have a little <laughs> sitting kind of practice. Okay, so getting yourself ready for some prostrations, we'll do the short version. Renew your bodhicitta. Oetam dente de jin je padra jampa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham dente de jin je padra jampa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham dente de jin je padra jampa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham dente de jin je padra jampa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham din te de jin je pa dra jam pa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham din te de jin je pa dra jam pa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Cham din te de jin je pa dra jam pa yam da pa so pe sangye rin chin ga so la cha tsa. Om Namo Bhagavate Rednu Gantu Radzaya Tatagatai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayat Om Radne Radne Maha Radne Radna Bitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Rednu Gantu Radzaya Tatagatai Ahate Samyak Sam Buddhaya Tayat Om Radne Radne Maha Radne Radna Bitsaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Rednu Gantu Radzaya Tayata <laughs> Tayata Om Radne Radne Maha Radne Radna Bidzaye Soha Om Namo Bhagavate Radne Gadu Razaya Tata Gatai Ahate Samyak Zambodai 
Kayata, Om Radne Radne Maha Radne Radna Bidze So, Om Namo Bhagavate Ranu Ketu Radzaya, Tajai Gataya, Tate Samyak Sam Hurai, Tayata, Om Radne Radne Maha Radne Radna Bidze So, Om Namo Menju Shri Namo Su Shri Namo Om Tama Shri So Om Namo Menju Shri Namo Su Shri Namo Om Tama Shri So Om Namo Menju Shri Namo Su Shri Namo Om Tama Shri So Homage to the confession of the Bodhisattva's downfalls. I, throughout all times, take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I, Throughout all times, take refuge in the I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I throughout all times take refuge in the I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dhamma, I take refuge in the Sangha. To the founder, Bhagavan Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious conqueror, Shakyamuni Buddha, I prostrate. To Tathagata, thoroughly destroying with Vaja essence, I prostrate. Tathagata, radiant jewel, I prostrate. Tathagata, king lord of the Nagas, I prostrate. Tathagata, army of heroes, I prostrate. Tathagata, delighted hero, I prostrate. Tathagata, jewel fire, I prostrate. Tathagata, jewel moonlight, I prostrate. Tathagata, meaningful to see, I prostrate. Tathagata, jewel moon, I prostrate. Tathagata, stainless one, I prostrate. Tathagata, bestowed with courage, I prostrate. Tathagata, pure one, I prostrate. Tathagata, bestowed with purity, I prostrate. Tathagata, water god, I prostrate. Tathagata, deity, the water god. Tathagata, glorious goodness, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious sandalwood, I prostrate. Tathagata, infinite splendor, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious light, I prostrate. Tathagata, sorrowless glory, I prostrate. Tathagata, son of non craving, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious flower, I prostrate. Tathagata, pure light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. Tathagata, lotus light rays, clearly knowing by play, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious wealth, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious mindfulness, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious name, widely renowned, I prostrate. Tathagata, king holding the victory banner of Fomos power, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious one, totally subduing, I prostrate. Tathagata, utterly victorious in battle, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious transcendence through subduing, I prostrate. Tathagata, glorious manifestations illuminating all, I prostrate. Tathagata, all subduing to a lotus, I Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of the Lord of Mountains, firmly seated on a jewel and lotus, I prostrate. The Seven Medicine Buddhas. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, renowned, glorious king of excellent signs, I prostrate. To the Bhagawan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, king of melodious sound, brilliant radiance of skill, adorned with jewels, moon, and lotus, I prostrate. To the Bhagawan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, stainless, excellent gold, illuminating jewel, who accomplishes all conduct, I prostrate. To the Bhagawan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, glorious supreme one, free from sorrow, I prostrate. In the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, melodious ocean of proclaimed Dharma, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, clearly knowing by the play of supreme wisdom of an ocean of Dharma, I prostrate. To the Bhagavan, Tathagata Arhat, perfectly completed Buddha, medicine guru, king of lapis lazuli light, I prostrate. All those, you 35 Buddhas and others, as many Tathagatas, Arhats, perfectly completed Buddhas, as there are existing, sustaining, and residing in all the world systems of the ten. All you Buddha Bhagavans, please pay attention to me. In this life, in all the states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara throughout beginning of slides, whatever negative actions I have created, made others create or rejoice in the creation of. Whatever possessions of stupas, possessions of sangha, or possessions of the sangha, of the ten directions that I have appropriated, made others appropriate or rejoice in the appropriation. 
Whichever among the five actions of immediate retribution I have done, calls to be done, or rejoiced in the doing of. Whichever paths of the ten non-virtuous actions I have engaged in, caused others to engage in, or rejoiced in the engaging in. Whatever I have created, being obscured by these karmas, causes me and sentient beings to be born in the hell realms, in the animal realm, in the preda realm, and irreligious as barbarians, or as long-life gods, with imperfect faculties, holding wrong views, or not being pleased with the Buddha's descent. In the presence of the Buddha Bhagavans who are transcendental wisdom, who are eyes, who are witnesses, who are and who see with omniscient consciousness. I'm admitting and confessing all these negativities. I will not conceal them nor hide them. And from now on in the future, I will abstain and refrain from committing them again. All Buddha Bhagavans, please pay attention to me. In this life and all other states of rebirth in which I have circled in samsara throughout beginningless life. Whatever roots of virtue I've created by generosity, even as little as giving just one mouthful of food to a being born in the animal realm, whatever roots of virtue I've created by guarding morality, whatever roots of virtue I've created by following pure conduct, whatever roots of virtue I've created by fully ripening sentient beings, whatever roots of virtue I've created by generating bodhi, and whatever roots of virtue I've created by my unsurpassed transcendental wisdom, all these assembled and gathered combined together, I fully dedicate to the unsurpassed, the unexcelled, that higher than the, that superior to the superior. Thus, I completely dedicate to the highest, perfectly complete enlightenment, just as the previous Buddha Bhagavans have fully dedicated, just as the future Buddha Bhagavans will fully dedicate, and just as the presently abiding Buddha Bhagavans are fully dedicating, like that I too dedicate fully. I confess all negative actions individually. I rejoice in all merits. I urge and implore all Buddhas to grant my May I receive the highest, most sublime, transcendental wisdom. To the conquerors, the best of humans, those who are living in the present time, those who have lived in the past, and those who will likewise. To all those who have qualities as vast as an infinite ocean, with hands folded, I approach for refuge. The general confession. Uhula, woe is me. O great Guru, Bajadara, all other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the ten directions and all the venerable Sangha, please pay attention to me. I, who am named, circling in cyclic existence since beginningless time until the present, overpowered by mental afflictions such as attachment, aversion, and ignorance, by means of body, speech, and mind have created the 10 non-virtuous actions. I've engaged in the five uninterrupted negative karmas and the five nearing uninterrupted negative karmas. I've transgressed the vows of individual liberation, transgressed the vows of Bodhisattva, and transgressed the Samaya of secret mantra. I have been disrespectful to my parents, have been disrespectful to my Vajra masters and to my abbot, and have been disrespectful to my spiritual friends living in ordination. I've committed actions harmful to the three jewels, avoided the holy dharma, criticized the Arya Sangha, harmed sentient beings, and so on. These and many other non-virtuous negative actions I have done, have caused others to do, have rejoiced in others' doings. In the presence of the great Guru, Vajadara, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who abide in the ten directions and the venerable Sangha, I admit this entire collection of faults and transgressions that are obstacles to my own higher rebirth and liberation and our causes of cyclic existence in miserable lower realms. I will not conceal them, and I accept them as negative. I promise to refrain from doing these actions again in the future. By confessing and acknowledging them, I will attain and abide in happiness, while by not confessing and acknowledging them, true happiness will not come. I think that through the force of reciting these names of the 35 Buddhas of Confession and Medicine Buddhas, through the power of their pure prayers and vows, through the power of generating regret and the other opponent forces, and through the power of having made these prostrations, nectar and light rays descend from the holy bodies of the Buddhas, completely purifying all negative karmas, defilements, and imprints collected on your mental continuum since beginningless time. Generate strong faith that your mind has become completely pure. So um, in this next break, the thing that I want you to think about just as a thought experiment is to be aware particularly of your negativities of the body because you're having a you know nice long break time. You'll have lunch, you'll you know stretch, you'll walk around, you'll read whatever. Um, to just really have in the back of your mind, what are the physical negativities that I get up to? 
and also just noticing the way your body is and the way you use your body in kind of in between time spaces. So just a general physical awareness in this break time. And what you're of course looking at is, you know, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, right? Obvious non-virtues of body, but also just kind of notice like, what do you, you, how do you use your body when it has anger, when it has attachment, like when the food is coming, you know, is there a gobbling, gobbling, or is it like a slow and mindful, or um, is there kind of like a, a way of using your physicality that is showing you something about which affliction might be ready to arise? Um, so body awareness is the theme for the break, both just those very specific non-virtues, but also just generally just being aware of what's going on with my body and how does that show me what's going on with my mind? That can be really, really useful. So body's the theme. And after lunch, the um, purification that we'll do is Vajrasattva and we'll focus particularly on purifying physical negativities. So that's what we're going to get up to. Um, do you have any questions while the practice is fresh on your mind before we finish for this session? I was just wondering, because there's a lot going on, you know, kind of holding that regret and then speaking the names and reciting the confession and doing the prostrations. Um, is there kind of a priority of what we should be trying to hold it's, it's kind of like one piece informs the other, but you're not necessarily able to hold all the pieces simultaneously, right? So in the beginning, you're really focusing on refuge and bodhicitta. Yeah. Founder Bhagawan Tadagata Arhat, you know, as soon as that part starts, then that's really the remedy. That's really the power of remedy. So just really focus on name and visualization during name and visualization. If you were also able to remember some regret during that time, that's great. But if you can't, don't worry about it. So, you know, refuge where it's obvious, refuge at the very beginning bit. Then the remedy is the names and the visualization, the actual going up and down, that is all the power of remedy. So if you can just kind of have a general sense of where you are in the visualization, even if it's not clear yet, and a general sense of trying to get your mouth around the names out loud, that's a good priority. And then when you get into the prayer um, at the end, then it's generating the power of regret kind of in a different order than we normally do. You know, normally we do refuge, then regret, then remedy, right? But in this practice, rem the regret comes later. And it kind of is like, if you don't remember what you got up to, here's some possibilities, <laughs> right? So you're generating the power of regret during that practice. And you can continue to prostrate during that prayer or just stand with your palms together or sit with your palms together during that part. So depending on your energy level. Yeah, and then we get to the general confession as well. And that's a lot about the power of resolve. So if you can just kind of be trying to say as much of the practice aloud as you can, saying these practices aloud help your speech merit and your speech purification. Um, visualizing helps purify the mind. All these things come together. But in terms of each section, kind of let the section point you to what's being emphasized. And don't feel like you have to squeeze it all in. It's more like once it's really, really familiar, you keep it like vivid enough that you can add in more once you start getting space for more. Yeah. So those last bits of the prayers are the record, the, um, re the, 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 are the um, regret and then the resolve. Regret and then resolve. And then they dissolve and absorb. And um, when the Buddhas dissolve and absorb, whether it explicitly says so or not, just take a minute to remember emptiness. All right, well, if you have any questions, we can do them next session as well. So we'll go ahead and dedicate. Janchu semchorim poshe ma ke panam ke gyuchi ke pan yam pa me pa yi gone gone.